Hey, crime connoisseurs. If you're like me, you love diving into a good book. I especially love finding a book about cases we cover. But sometimes it's hard to find the time to sit and read. We live in an on-the-go society. Thankfully, Audible makes it easy to instantly access the books we love without sacrificing our time. With over 180,000 audiobooks and more, you will undoubtedly find one that will grip you and leave you not wanting to pull away while still being able to do other things. You can get a free 30-day trial membership by going to audibletrial.com backslash ccpod to start listening to your favorite books. That's audibletrial.com backslash ccpod for your free 30-day trial membership. Hey, all my fellow crime connoisseurs. I'm your host, Grace D. And today's case is different from the one that I was originally planning and researching for this week, but when my cousin Matthew told me about it, I just went down the rabbit hole more and more and more. So much so that I had to completely abandon what I was already working on so I could cover this case next because I became so engrossed with it. Picture it. Cape May Courthouse, 1997. It's a snowy winter night with no soul in sight at about midnight. A husband and a wife are headed to their local hospital with their 18-month-old daughter when the vehicle suddenly veers off the road, through a utility pole, and into a ditch. One person's dead, but was it an accident or was it murder? This is the mysterious case of Tracy Thomas. Tracy Rose was born on June 26, 1959 in Massachusetts. Tracy grew up in Hyannis and was a very talented ballerina. She was so talented that at 14 years old, she was recruited by the Boston Ballet School, a commitment that required her to travel from Hyannis to Boston twice a week, about an hour and 15 minutes each way. Tracy received her bachelor's degree from Skidmore College and graduated in 1982. After this, she worked for a consulting company and continued her education. She went on to earn her graduate degree in business from Northeastern University in 1985. While in Boston, in the fall of 1987, Tracy met Eric Thomas. Eric was originally from New York, but moved to South Carolina in middle school. He received his undergraduate from South Carolina State University and continued his studies at Tufts, a well-renowned dentistry university in Boston. Eric was on a scholarship from the United States Army ROTC. Tracy and Eric fell in love and married on September 21, 1991. After Eric graduated from Tufts in 1991, it was time for him to serve in the Army. Eric served as a captain and dentist in the U.S. Army Dental Corps. He was stationed in Alabama, Texas, South Carolina, Berlin, and Heidelberg, Germany. While the couple was stationed in Germany, Tracy got pregnant and gave birth to their daughter, Alex Rose Thomas, in 1995. Later that year, after serving his time in the Army, Eric and Tracy moved their new little family to Cape May Courthouse, New Jersey. Eric wanted to open his own practice, and they learned of another dentist in the area looking to sell his practice so he could retire. This worked out perfectly for them, and despite Tracy being a new mom, she managed the office for Eric. Things were going well for the Thomases. Eric's private practice was thriving, and in August of 1996, he and Tracy found out they were expecting another child. On Sunday, February 9, 1997, at around 12.30 a.m., Tracy and Eric decided to take their 18-month-old daughter, Alex, to Burdett Tomlin Memorial Hospital, now called Cape Regional Medical Center, in Cape May Courthouse, New Jersey. 
Alex had been suffering from hives and a fever that had progressively gotten worse. It was a snowy night where it had accumulated up to three inches. Growing up in New England winters and just living in Germany for a bit, Tracy was no rookie to driving in the snow. Eric went out to start the car to warm it up before they headed to the hospital. Tracy, now six months pregnant, got behind the wheel of the family's Ford Explorer. Eric was in the front passenger seat, and Alex was strapped in her car seat in the back, and they went on their way. While driving down Hand Avenue, the Explorer veered off the road, crashed through a telephone pole shearing it at the base, and continued traveling about 50 feet before stopping in a shallow grassy ditch. It wasn't until about an hour later before someone else was driving by, saw the Explorer in its condition, and used their cell phone to call 911. The call came in to the Middle Township Police Department. Middle Township is incorporated by 16 towns and villages, the largest of which is Cape May Courthouse. Detective William Scott Webster was at home around 2 a.m. listening to his portable police scanner when he heard the call come through. Given the snowy road conditions, it wasn't a surprise that there would have been an accident. Detective Webster made his way to the accident and was met with a couple of paramedics, three other police officers, and an investigator from the county medical examiner's office. The Ford Explorer's left headlight was smashed, but the right one was still lit. The taillights were illuminated and the engine was still running. The airbags were deployed inside, and first responders were faced with a tragic scene. A woman behind the wheel and a male front passenger were either unconscious or worse, and a toddler was in the back seat, who appeared to be well-strapped in. We know these people to be the Thomas family. Alex was alert and upon inspection was unharmed, and Eric had been knocked unconscious. Unfortunately, Tracy displayed no vital signs and was removed from the car. Tracy was a small woman, five foot four and slightly built, which was somewhat difficult to discern because she was six months pregnant. It was a daunting sight of the airbags and the excessive tightness of the shoulder hardness of her seatbelt for first responders. By the time she was extracted, placed on a backboard, and covered with a sheet, Tracy and her unborn child had been dead for at least an hour and a half. She was pronounced dead at the scene. Detective Webster was at the scene for about an hour before going to the emergency room where Eric and Alex were transported by ambulance. Eric didn't have any severe injuries. At the hospital, Eric gave Detective Webster and the investigator from the medical examiner's office an account of what happened. Detective Webster conducted another interview two days later, and many more details came to light when Eric complained of neck pain. He had been transferred to and discharged from the trauma unit at Atlantic Care Regional Medical Center in Atlantic City. Eric said the three inches of snow that night didn't deter Tracy since she spent most of her life in New England, so she had plenty of winter driving experience. On top of that, she also had the experience driving in Germany's winters while Eric was stationed there with the Army for more than three years before they moved to courthouse. According to Eric, Tracy insisted on driving to the hospital, so he warmed up the Explorer in their driveway. Eric said on her way to the SUV, Tracy had slipped and fell face first, quickly got up, brushed herself off, and got behind the wheel. They drove a little more than a mile before a deer jumped out in front of them. Eric said that he didn't see the deer despite wearing his glasses and that he only knew of it because Tracy had mentioned it before the crash and it was the last thing he heard. Eric told Detective Webster that Tracy was driving about 25 miles per hour when she saw the deer, but instead of braking, she veered off the road to avoid it, resulting in crashing into the wooden pole. Next thing he knew, first responders were surrounding him and shining lights in his eyes. While Eric was hospitalized, family members from both sides came together. Eric's family came up from South Carolina. Tracy's parents came down from Massachusetts, and her sister from North Jersey came down to be with Eric and Alex. Together, the families looked after and cared for Alex until Eric was well. Tracy's body was taken to the morgue, and an autopsy was performed. In New Jersey, the state law requires an autopsy to be performed on all deaths when there's a death involving a motor vehicle collision on drivers, 
occupants, and pedestrians. The Cape May County Medical Examiner, Dr. Elliot Gross, conducted Tracy's autopsy. He determined that Tracy had died due to blunt force trauma with asphyxia relating to the accident and closed the case. Two days later, Eric requested Tracy's body be cremated, saying it was his wife's wishes. Tracy's memorial service was a standing room only event. Many people, including the mayor, attended. The mayor said it was, quote, one of the saddest funerals I've ever attended, end quote. Now, we're going to fast forward two years, and we will cover the events that happened in those two years, but it's essential to start here first. On February 1st, 1999, almost two years to the day of Tracy's death, Eric filed a wrongful death suit against Ford Motor Company and two other firms that manufactured crash sensors and airbag modules used in Ford products in the Federal District Court in Camden, New Jersey, charging that his wife was killed by the force of an airbag opening at 200 miles per hour. The plaintiffs were Eric, his daughter Alex, and the estate of Tracy Rose Thomas, seeking unspecified damages, possibly millions and millions of dollars. Eric's attorneys were from a suburban Philadelphia law firm that took the case on a contingent fee basis. They orchestrated a skillful public relations campaign, portraying him as the grieving husband, instead of a newlywed man. That's right. About 17 months after Tracy's death, Eric got married to a woman who just so happens to be his old high school sweetheart. But we'll come back to this. The National Highway Traffic Safety Administration compiled statistics showing children especially were dying or being seriously injured in airbag-triggering crashes and that small women were also disproportionately at risk. However, Nowhere in the airbag mortality database was asphyxia mentioned. They also conducted a crash investigation and estimated that Tracy was traveling approximately 25 to 35 miles per hour during the time of the accident. The National Highway Traffic Safety Administration report supported the claim that the airbag killed Tracy. Eric's lawsuit, filed by attorneys Thomas Mellon and Elliot Kolodny, soon became a mass of police reports, legal transcripts, court filings, medical reports, and depositions. According to court records, Eric's actions after Tracy's death caused her parents to become suspicious of him. Tracy's family first raised suspicion after her death in 1998 when they reviewed the police reports. Given Eric's new and odd demeanor, the Roses and Tracy's sister Wendy began questioning themselves about things. Things from the accident just didn't make sense. In late October 1998, Mrs. Rose and Wendy went down to the Cape May Courthouse Police Station and requested a copy of the official police reports relating to Tracy's death. They weren't sure what they were looking for in the reports. At first, Mrs. Rose couldn't even bring herself to read them, so she delegated the task to Wendy. As Wendy reviewed the documents, a particular one stood out the transcript of Detective Webster's second interview with Eric. Wendy said in an interview with The New Yorker, quote, As soon as I read that police report, I knew it. I said something was very wrong here. End quote. The transcript was filled with hesitations and omitted phrases that struck the Rose family as evidence of insincerity. When Eric told Detective Webster of Tracy's fall on her way to the car, He made it sound like she was clumsy, but she was anything but that. Remember, Tracy was such a gifted ballerina that the Boston Ballet School recruited her at 14. In the transcript, Eric doesn't really seem to have answers to simple questions. It goes, Detective Webster, was she injured during the fall? Eric, to my knowledge, I don't know. Detective Webster, did she hit her face on the ground? Eric. I think she did. I think she did. From what I, I know, I probably, looking back, I probably should have looked closer at her a little closer, but I didn't. So I, I don't know. Uh. 
Eric also told Detective Webster that Tracy had experienced pregnancy-related dizziness and blackout episodes. This immediately had me screaming to myself, why would you let her drive after that? And I wasn't the only one. This provoked more skeptical questions from the Rose family. The Roses questioned, why would a man whose vertigo-prone pregnant wife had just taken a fall to the face allow her to drive, let alone on a snowy night? Aside from that, the family insisted that with Alex's fever, Tracy never would have chosen to be up front and leave the baby alone in the back seat. Heck, Tracy would have sat in the back seat with Alex in her arms and held her the entire way to the hospital in the back if she could. After about a month, the Rose family felt they needed a court ruling to protect their rights for visitation with Alex. So the family traveled down to Cape May County to talk with a lawyer. The same day they came down to meet with an attorney, they also met with Detective Webster. They told him that they believed Tracy's death was not an accident. Detective Webster kindly listened to them and did his best, but explained to them there wasn't anything he could really do at this time. The case was closed because of the medical examiner's report. The preference to reopen it resided with the county prosecutor. And unfortunately, without having any hard evidence, the prosecutor wasn't going to go that route. Detective Webster also told the family that they could try to hire an independent medical examiner, but they would need an attorney. They couldn't afford an attorney for that. They explained they planned to spend the money on an attorney to represent them in family court. He told them, under the circumstances, they might want to consider getting in touch with the right people at Ford. See, up to this point, Eric hadn't filed his tort claim against Ford yet, but it was in the works. A few months earlier, a photo of Eric and Tracy was in the USA Today with a story about airbag fatalities and the caption said he was suing the automotive manufacturer. After the lawsuit was filed, Tracy's family tried getting Ford's interest in their suspicions for several months as Ford's attorneys began taking depositions and plotting their tactics. Wendy and Mrs. Rose regularly called the Ford headquarters in Dearborn, Michigan, and asked for the legal department. Unfortunately, they were continuously met with talking to people who didn't listen carefully to what they had to say. Until one day, one day, someone finally did pay attention to what they were saying. Mrs. Rose received a phone call from William Conroy, a lawyer from Philadelphia, whose firm had been hired by Ford. In the summer of 1999, Ford shifted the focus from the questions about airbag safety to why hadn't the plaintiff, Dr. Eric Thomas, been charged with murder yet? The Cape May County prosecutor followed the case to see what all would arise. The attorneys representing Ford were William Conroy and someone we all know from our very first episode, Glenn A. Zeitz. So in our first episode was the Maria Marshall case, and in there I was referring to him as Zietz. Uh, when I did my looking up of how to pronounce the name, that's what I was getting. But after the episode released, I was actually contacted by someone who was a juror on that case, and they informed me that his name was Zeitz. And yeah, so I'll be going back to re-record that. If you haven't listened to it, it's a it's a fun case. It's a doozy. Definitely go and follow along on that. Early on in the litigation, Ford deposed Eric. They cited discrepancies between the sworn testimony and statements he had made to investigators and inconsistencies with other records that Ford's lawyers had subpoenaed. Ford petitioned to depose Eric again, and his lawyers argued against this. Ford's goal was to shred Eric's credibility. The deposition testimony from medical examiner Dr. Gross was even more problematic for Eric. Now, even though Dr. Gross would not alter his assessment of the cause of death, he did admit that evidence was ambiguous, stating, quote, I considered, based on my findings, the death initially as suspicious. I conveyed this to the police, end quote. Detective Webster was also deposed, but he didn't recall having a conversation like this with Dr. Gross at that time. 
In fact, Detective Webster told Conroy that neither he nor the medical examiner had sufficient evidence to evaluate certain aspects of the investigation. Dr. Gross testified to finding petechial hemorrhages in Tracy's eyes and hemorrhages in the area of the larynx. Now, as crime connoisseurs, we know that these two key features are typically seen in manual strangulation. However, Dr. Gross's examination was framed by the understanding that the victim had died in a car crash. He testified, quote, If this body, not Mrs. Thomas, not on February 9th, not as an automobile accident, is brought in, and I do this autopsy, and I see the hemorrhages in the neck, and I see the petechial hemorrhages, and that's all I have, I would be very suspicious of the death as a strangulation, end quote. Uncover the secrets of your dog's DNA with Wisdom Panel, the world's leading canine genetics test. With a simple cheek swab, Wisdom Panel can reveal your dog's breed, ancestry, health traits, and so much more. Understanding your dog's genetic background can help you provide the best care possible. Whether it's identifying potential health risks, understanding their behavior, or simply satisfying your curiosity about your dog's unique heritage, Wisdom Panel delivers the insights you need. Their state-of-the-art technology analyzes over 350 breeds, types, and varieties, and screens for over 200 genetic health conditions. Plus, their easy-to-understand reports make it simple to learn about your dog's genetics. Join the millions of pet parents discovering their dog's story with Wisdom Panel. Order your kit today and start exploring your dog's DNA. Because every dog has a tail, and Wisdom Panel helps you tell it. Go to wisdompanel.pxf.io backslash ccpod to learn more about your four-legged friend. That's wisdompanel.pxf.io backslash ccpod. Ford hired their own medical experts, including Dr. Michael Baden, a well-known forensic pathologist. There just so happens to be a long-standing rivalry between Dr. Baden and Dr. Gross. This goes all the way back to the 70s when they both served controversial tenures as chief medical examiner of New York City. Ford also hired James Benedict, a physician and biochemical engineer specializing in injury causation and crashworthiness. Him and Dr. Baden both filed reports that made the same essential points. When an airbag deploys, it stays inflated for less than a second, so by itself, it cannot cause asphyxia, which required compression of the neck for multiple seconds. Asphyxia could result from a spinal cord injury, but Dr. Gross's autopsy didn't contain any damage like that. Dr. Baden's conclusion stated, quote, in my opinion, Mrs. Thomas died of compression of the neck by the hands of another, end quote. In March 2000, the product liability lawsuit transformed into a sensational case nationwide after the allegations of murder came to light. Eric's response to Ford's suggesting that he had killed his wife was to amend his legal complaint to include allegations of defamation and intentional infliction of emotional distress. To support Ford's theory that Eric murdered Tracy, they revealed that Eric had been having an affair with Stephanie, his high school sweetheart and now new wife at the time of the accident. When questioned by the police just days after the accident, and again in a deposition in May 1999, Eric said their marriage was excellent and denied having an affair. However, in his second deposition, on January 31, 2000, in a federal court, Eric admitted that he lied. He said that he and Stephanie Haley began their affair a few months before Tracy died. Eric also admitted that two months before her untimely death, he secretly spent several nights with Stephanie in New Brunswick, New Jersey, and Boston, Massachusetts. All while Tracy was led to believe that her husband was attending dental conferences. 
Eric testified that him and Stephanie had hugged and kissed on the first trip in New Brunswick, but on the trip to Boston, they had sexual intercourse. While talking about the Boston trip, Eric said it was a very embarrassing and humiliating circumstance. Ford's lawyers questioned Eric about a $355 charge on his credit card from Victoria's Secret in April 1997, just two months after Tracy's death. Eric admitted that he bought gifts for Stephanie, but also said that some items may have been for his mom, sister, or other family members. As if this wasn't bad enough, Eric also testified that he spent nights with Stephanie in hotels the month after Tracy died and through the spring of 1997. The two even vacationed together in Antigua in August 1997, just six months after Tracy's death. On top of all this, Stephanie was also married this entire time to a man named Sean Haley. By the summer of 1998, she had divorced Sean in February 98. Five months later in July, she married Eric and was living with him in Cape May Courthouse, and she was pregnant. Six months later, Stephanie gave birth to their son, Zach, and within a week of Zach's birth, Stephanie signed legal papers to adopt Alex officially. Tracy's mom, Doris, told The New Yorker that Eric said when Alex came to visit, Tracy's name could never be mentioned and all photographs had to be taken off the walls. She said, quote, He warned us that when Alex got home, he was going to question her about whether there had been any pictures on the walls. I wasn't going to go along with Eric's demands, but my husband said, I'll do anything to see Alex. So he did take down the pictures. End quote. Ford took a sworn statement from Sean Haley, testifying that in early 1997, Eric's phone number appeared consistently on a daily basis on his phone bills. When Sean questioned Stephanie about the seemingly business-related out-of-town trips, she admitted to meeting Eric on occasions in various locations throughout the country. Ford obtained copies of the phone records for the months following Tracy's death. Eric admitted in the deposition that from the fall of 1996 to the spring of 1997, he and Stephanie spoke on the phone at least 150 times, including seven, seven times on the day Tracy died. He also admitted how he increased the life insurance policy on Tracy. Let's break down the insurance policy and timeline. Eric first applied for insurance on Tracy in November 1996, one month after after reestablishing contact with Stephanie. In January 1997, just weeks before Tracy's death, Eric increased the coverage from 150000 to 200000 Eric also had a double indemnity provision for accidental death, so he was paid $400,000 in life insurance benefits. With his payout, Eric lowered his mortgage balance and repaid a $12,000 loan to Tracy's parents, a loan they gave him to help start his dental practice. In October 1999, the Cape May County Prosecutor's Office announced it had officially reopened the investigation into Tracy's death. Conroy told a reporter for a Philadelphia newspaper, quote, We're not trying to connect the dots on any of this. We just want to get the information, end quote. Shortly after Thanksgiving 1999, Eric and Stephanie welcomed another daughter, Logan, into the family. According to court documents, Conroy and Zeitz said that by Eric denying his affair in his first deposition and for nearly two years after that, Eric had committed perjury and fraud. They filed a motion on March 1, 2001, requesting the court to sanction Eric for lying under oath and ordering him to pay for the costs of their investigation into Tracy's death. They also asked Judge Joel Rosen to re-interview Eric, but Mellon and Kolodny asked the judge for more time to review the records. Judge Rosen scheduled a hearing for November 9th and barred attorneys on both sides from speaking with the media about the case. In April 2001, a federal court threw out Eric's defamation case against Ford, 
ruling that the company was immune from such suits while investigating claims against them. In an article from the Courier Post on Friday, July 6, 2001, Cape May County Prosecutor's Office requested the complete file that Ford put together against Eric. On October 11th, Judge Rosen ordered that Eric and Stephanie's depositions be postponed because the case could become criminal. Mellon and Kolodny had their own medical experts who stated unequivocally that Tracy's death was related to the airbags. They tried to get Dr. Baden's report excluded. According to Mellon and Kolodny, Eric had taken and passed two polygraph tests. Ford wanted to depose the polygraph examiners, even though we all know polygraphs aren't admissible in court. In an interview that Eric did with the Philadelphia Inquirer, he told them, quote, I can honestly tell you that I did not kill my wife. I can tell you the airbag did. I know that Tracy would do the same thing for me, end quote. Ford responded, quote, This case began as any other product liability lawsuit, and we hired experts to identify the cause of the accident and injuries. Our suspicions arose when the airbag played absolutely no role in Tracy Thomas's unfortunate death. Mrs. Thomas died of compression of the neck at the hands of another, end quote. Before Judge Rosen ruled on the motion to exclude Dr. Baden's report, something that no longer required his ruling had happened. On Thursday, July 5, 2001, Eric Thomas dropped his suit against Ford Motor Company and the other two manufacturers. He said he could no longer continue the lawsuit because of the mounting legal bills that took a toll. Eric had lost his credibility as a witness because he was having an affair with his current wife at the time of his late wife's death and was lying about it under oath. The next day, during a 25-minute proceeding in the U.S. District Court of Camden, Eric only spoke to indicate that he understood the meaning of the dismissal. Carl Poplar, one of Eric's attorneys, said a cost analysis showed it would be in Eric's best interest to drop the lawsuit that the case made no economic sense. Poplar estimated that Eric had already spent about $250,000 and would likely double that to get the case to trial. He also said that a jury verdict in Eric's favor probably wouldn't even cover all of the legal expenses. According to Poplar, he had a series of difficult conversations with Eric and Stephanie when deciding to drop the case and that they were disappointed. Zeitz said he didn't believe Eric dropped the suit because of the money concerns. Quote, They realized there was no way they could win this case. They knew they were on the Titanic. End quote. Conroy said that Mellon and Kolodny pursued an aggressive case against their client without regard for money. Tracy's family told authorities in Cape May Courthouse that Eric Thomas once said of the lawsuit, quote, If things get out of hand and they ask too many questions, I'm going to drop it, end quote. The legal battle was widely viewed as a David vs. Goliath case. You have a small-town dentist going up against a Fortune 500 company with endless resources. On Thursday, February 21, 2002, the acting Cape May County prosecutor, J. David Mayer said he believed Tracy died by nature of homicide. However, Mayer said that the conflicted opinions by the several forensic pathologists made it unlikely that a jury would convict Eric. So they were dismissing the case against him. The dismissal was a concern for Wendy. She believed that the Cape May County authorities dragged their feet while Ford conducted their investigation. And since Ford was no longer involved, Wendy feared that she and the family might never learn what truly happened to Tracy that night. Eric Thomas was never formally charged with Tracy's death. He still resides and practices dentistry in Cape May Courthouse. Many of those around Eric stood by his side during the lawsuit and through the allegations made against him during the case. Eric and Stephanie have three children. 
Alex from Eric's marriage with Tracy, whom Stephanie formally adopted in 1999, and two children they had together, Zach and Logan. In 2016, Eric was awarded Middle Township Volunteer of the Year for his work with educating local students and participating in local health fairs on dental health. In 2020, after 25 years of service in Cape May Courthouse, Eric expanded his practice and moved to a new location, still in Courthouse, but on the main drag. This year, Eric was awarded the 2023 Middle Township Chamber of Commerce Business Person of the Year Award. And that's the mysterious case of Tracy Thomas. So what do you think? Was it the airbags? Or was it murder? Be sure to leave a comment on the Instagram account at Crime Connoisseurs and let me know what you think. In the meantime, keep it classy, connoisseurs, and I'll catch you on the next case. Are you tired of settling for subpar cat food? It's time to upgrade your cat's dining experience with Smalls, the ultimate gourmet meal for your feline companion. Say goodbye to generic one-size-fits-all cat food. With Smalls, you can rest assured that your furry friend is getting the nutrition they deserve. Join the thousands of cat owners who have made the switch to Smalls and see the difference it can make in your cat's health and happiness. Treat your cat to the finest dining experience with Smalls. Visit smalls.sjv.io backslash ccpod now to order your first box. That's smalls.sjv.io backslash ccpod. Choose Smalls because your cat deserves the best.